infrastructure, you know, water, sewer, uh, those kinds of, of projects. So this was really uh, kind of out of their normal uh, uh, wheelhouse. And uh, we were making the point that nonprofit organizations in our states are doing an awful lot of work that really help with the economies of their local communities. And we wanted to show some demonstrations of that. Uh, so uh, we received uh, a good number of applicants. I believe the number was uh, 16 or so, uh, Ali, um, and uh, were able to award five, uh, five applications. Uh, they wanted, um, and, and so did we, uh, to have them be as substantial as possible in terms of the awards. So uh, we weren't going to be giving out you know, five uh, and ten thousand dollars, but rather enough money to make a difference uh, in, in communities and for them, uh, the communities in, in turn, to be able to show results uh, from these grants. So uh, we were thrilled with, uh, with the participation on this new program, um, and we received some very good uh, applications as well. So uh, you'll be hearing from, um, uh, from most of those that were successful today, and uh, then we'll be open to talk about, in general, this program um, and other activities. And one other uh, quick note, uh, we also uh, were uh, very fortunate this year uh, to receive, really without asking, um, funding from, uh, from the 1772 Foundation. Um, they're out of Rhode Island. They have funded us before for a variety of our uh, programs, but primarily our Protect and Sell uh, program. And uh, they're very interested in, in that whole aspect of, of nonprofits and real estate. Um, but uh, they also made funds available, $100,000, as I said, in Maine uh, for nonprofits that are doing historic preservation. So uh, that was more pure preservation type projects. So uh, we're not talking about that today. This, uh, this session is about the Northern Border Regional Commission, but I wanted to mention that as well. So I'd um, be happy to answer any questions, but just wanted to provide a little bit of a framing of uh, what, uh, what went on in order to receive the funds. Yeah, and if folks are interested, we do have the uh, list of the 1772 Foundation grantees at the, at the close of this presentation um, for folks to take a look at. And I'll just uh, throw in here, um, partly for the grantees, because I don't think that they were aware of this. This was the composition of the grant review panel um, that reviewed um, the grant applications, and it's a great cross-section of culture and finance um, from around Maine, uh, really reflecting not only the interest in culture and preservation values, but also in, you know, hard economics, you know, pro looking for projects that would deliver real impact in their communities. Um, and without further ado, these are the five projects that were awarded. Um, you're going to hear from four of them today. So rather than looking at this slide, we're going to move into our first uh, grantee, which is the Musée Cultural du Mont Carmel. And um, Don will say that much more elegantly than I would. Don is here and he's the director of the association um, and he's at the rectory of this fine building now. Um, so Don, if you want to unmute yourself and maybe um, set the stage and then I can share the video and then we'll roll into your slides. Yeah, uh, you, you did a pretty good job with it, Ali. It's Musée Cultural du Mont Carmel. And little is a little village between Van Buren and Madawaska in the St. John Valley. And we face the uh, border, the St. John River, and our land touches the border uh, and then goes back two miles from the border. And this little video was taken by a tourist that came by last week. And um, you can just go ahead with it. And it shows. You can see on the uh, on the towers um, where the angels are, the lichen that is growing on the towers, that black stuff, it's not peeling paint, it's lichen. And we need to uh, neutralize that. Uh, and we can neutralize it with a thing called spray and forget, which is really, um, among other chemicals, it has uh, chlorine in it. St. John River, of course, on the right-hand side of the screen is Canada. On the left-hand side is is us, you can see how close we are. We're literally 
about 300 feet from the border. Great. Shows how the roof also has that same problem. We see it again a little bit later. Shows in the cemetery a bit. Hey, so Don, I'm going to make you the host now so that you can present. Hold on, please, for ladies and gentlemen. Not technical difficulties, but I have to pull up the screen to let him share. Oh, so frustrating. Okay. All right. All right, there you go, Don. You're the host now. Okay. Well, I'll start with some uh, some pictures of the exterior of the building. And um, what one of the problems that uh, we we had with this with this uh, whole grant is what we're doing is we're uh, we're reattaching plaster that has fallen, and we're also taking care of some water problems from roofs, and you know water and snow problems from roofs. Uh, this particular uh, roof in the front of the building, um, you see these very small, um, uh, you see these small flat parts of the roof. We have to uh, take the flashing and gather that together like a gargoyle would and, uh, and direct the uh, water down uh, into, it's, my cursor is going crazy. I just click, I uh, wonder if I'll get another. Okay, there, there. Why is that not going to the next slide? I'm going to stop the share and then I'll go back and share again and maybe I'll pick it up right. Yeah, we did have this working, so. I did, yeah. Yeah. This shows, this shows the um, problems with rot on the sills. Uh, one, one problem that we had, uh, one thing we wanted to do is we wanted to reface the, uh, the way the sills transition onto the concrete foundation and it was gathering water and when we took it the facing off in order to replenish it we found that the sills were rotten uh here is the um the what we call the cover or the entrance to the cellar and it uh the ice came off the roof of the building over the course of 20 years and hits that and this year it collapsed the roof so we took the roof off and we're using um eight by eight beams for the new roof they're going to be it's going to be like like a, a floor in a in a castle in france where you have these huge beams that are only a foot apart uh and then we're going to face it with steel with quarter inch thick steel so that when the ice comes off it's going to pulverize the pulverize the ice rather than the cover roof. it shows uh the this is the first slide i showed uh, one problem with the, the uh, front vestibule roofs was when um, when uh, the I, when the water comes off. Can you see my cursor on this? Probably not. Oh, you can. Great. When you, the water comes off this, it drips down the roof, and all of this was rotten. We've had to replace this, and the sheathing was two layers of inch thick boards uh, diagonally on the building. We had to remove that and replace it and get, get right down to the, um, to the studying. And so now we want to, again, create the, this channel in order for water to fall down straight. And there's, a, there's a, a drain right here. And we'd like to put an urn over it that's going to catch the water. And it'll go deep in, into the water rather than splash on the building. It'll splash on the interior of the urn. Why is that not advancing again? Isn't that strange? We have to go back to that again. That's, isn't that amazing? This shows some of the rot on some of the sills. This is on a tower sill. On the, it turns out that on the other side of the front, 
uh, they had repaired uh, some rot that had happened before, and uh, we found that it hadn't it hadn't rotted again. So we're going to cover that back up, and that was a relief to find out. This shows you the drain. More of the sill rot. Now we come to the uh, plaster work on the interior of the uh, building. So um, this shows uh, we have um, uh, a 78 year old man who works for us and he's been putting together the thousands of pieces of plaster that have fallen off. And you can see they're assembled. Some of them are assembled here. He has an iPad. We take a, a photograph of the void we want to fill with the iPad, pass it down to him. He enlarges it on the iPad and can fit the piece on to the iPad. And then they figure out where it is and then take it up to the... Uh... This shows uh, one of the, the ceilings that is almost complete. Uh, what, we, what we're trying to do here is to get all of the painting and stencil work on there first, that's our top priority. And then the voids that don't have, uh, that have just plain plaster, we're going to wait. And if we have the time, we'll piece them in. Uh, if we don't have the time, we could plaster them in. But I think we're gonna have the time because uh, it's going to go a lot quicker as, as we're going. The first one is most difficult because you're picking out of thousands of pieces of plaster. And we have have the plaster for four bays. And we're finding that in bay two, it's becoming a lot easier. This shows how we're going to finish off the sills on the exterior. Uh, these are, this is pressure treated wood uh, that fits in. And then we're going to have a metal piece that goes over this, over this, and then out over the foundation by two inches. So that there's no possibility of any backflow going up, up into the sills. Shows you in some places. We didn't dare hack at it because it goes in four inches. I'm admitting people, I hope that. <laughs> Don, thank you for doing that because I, I realized afterwards that we can't do it once you've yeah. been the host. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, so now I'll go to the interior ones. Where are they? They're right here. This shows. Um, the, the condition of the ceiling. On the one that you saw the scaffolding, this is what it looked like before. So you can see how much plaster we put back together. This shows um, the plaster is thin. It's less than a quarter of an inch thick. I think we may have lost Don. Shoot. Okay. Well, in that instance, I'm going to reclaim hosting privileges if you'll hold for a moment. And um, hopefully, he'll be able to join us um, so that we can hear more from him. Just a moment, if you will. I look to find the right screen. There we go. Okay. All right. Well, Patrick, I think we're going to turn it over to you and hopefully Don will hop back on. So I am making you the host. And Patrick Myers is the executive director of the Center Theater up in Dover Foxcroft. And they have a lovely movie theater that hopefully you'll all get to visit at some point post COVID. <laughs> and um, he's gonna tell us about uh, his project. Indeed. Well, thanks everybody. Um, I told Ali earlier in an email, I can talk about the theater all day. So hopefully I've cut it down a bit and we can uh, into something that's enjoyable. Um, let's get my screen shared here. All right. Oh. Excellent. Um, Ali, I 
I see a couple people in the waiting room. Can you let them in or do you want me to? Um, can, can you actually admit them? This yeah. is a limitation of the host situation. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm clicking here, hold on. <laughs> Yeah, we, we didn't want to use webinar for those attendees. We want to make it social and that, and that presents its own challenges. <laughs> so thanks, Patrick, for playing yep. host. I think, I think that's everyone. I didn't see Dawn on the list, so I'll just keep going. All right, so I'm assuming everyone's seen this beautiful picture of the Center Theater. Um, really is an icon of downtown Dover Foxcroft. And uh, the, the support of uh, the NHEP as well as lots of other funders are going to be really making this space over here come alive like it probably has never been before. The theater in general uh, was built back in the 1940s, in 1940, um, after the previous movie theater in town burned down. That one replaced the previous movie theater that had also burned down. It was an unfortunate tendency of those old movie theaters. Uh, some of the original publicity for the center theater uh, really touted its fireproof construction. Oops. And we're, we're all glad for that because it so far so good, knock on wood. Uh, this is a picture of the theater once it was completed. Love the old cars there in the front. As you can see over on that uh, side of the building, the second screen space that this project is focused on was always a storefront that was rented out over the years for lots of different businesses. I couldn't even count them all. While the theater was in operation after 1940, it uh, really served the culture of the time. So uh, Errol Flynn certainly made several appearances over that time and other things uh, of historical Importance. So we did show Reefer Madness back in 1940. Apparently the community was very concerned about the uh, evils of marijuana and jazz music, uh, but also things like war bond rallies. At that point, the theater really was primarily a movie theater. The stage was very small. Elvis, Psycho, Jerry Lewis, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. You know, everything that you would expect a classic movie theater to be showing was shown here. Unfortunately, as the uh, economic downturn in rural Maine really was kicking in after World War II and then getting worse through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the center theater itself fell victim to that. People didn't have as much disposable income. Bigger movie theaters were opening up. A uh, lot more options on television, and so uh, 1969, the theater closed for the first time. Oops. It has a life of its own, apparently. Uh, theater closed originally. There was an attempt to reopen it in the early 70s. That failed. Uh, it went to the bank for ownership. Our beautiful marquee on the front of the building got torn down in 1974 before it could get, before it could fall down on the sidewalk. And uh, after that, the theater was unoccupied. Uh, the auditorium was used for a number of different businesses as far as storage, but there were businesses in the storefronts, but nothing really was happening in the auditorium and it stayed very, very dark. Uh, in the 90s, it seemed like there was a, a resurgence in interest in the historic buildings in our community, and I've popped a few up here. You'll hear more about Central Hall when Leslie speaks later. Moosehead Factory, which has also been redeveloped. And then the Blethen House that you see down in the bottom there was a historic hotel built in the 1890s. Unfortunately, in the 1990s, it was torn down and replaced with a Rite Aid. Now, nothing against Rite Aids, but it really did galvanize local residents uh, in an effort to save some of the historic buildings. And one of the beneficiaries of that was the Center Theater. So in 1988, the theater's founding board uh, resolved to bring the theater back so it could be a cultural and economic engine for the region. And I always like to take a moment to recognize this list of founding board members. Uh, without their determination and frankly stubbornness, we wouldn't be where we are today. And as you can see again, that, uh, oops, boy, automatic advance, it's not a friend. You can see in that uh, building next door, uh, at that point it was a barbershop. 
uh, when the theater was able to purchase the building itself, we couldn't buy that next door space for several more years. And again, a variety of different businesses cycled through even during that time. Uh, there we go. The lobby of the theater was basically unrecognizable after so many businesses had cycled through, but the auditorium was looked like a 1960s, 70s auditorium. That's a picture from when we opened it up and got some light into the building. And then of course the cleanup, uh, lots of dirt, lots of trash. There was a room upstairs that was open to the air and was full of bird droppings for, from decades of use. And then in 1999, our very first program, our children's drama camp started, um, a way for us to build awareness and interest in theater in the community. Of course, at that time, the auditorium didn't have electricity or water or <laughs> lights or anything. So it was held at a local Grange Hall. But I'm happy to say that uh, even now with COVID-19, we are having a reduced drama camp, but it is still going in its 21st year. So back in those days, we tried to have some small events, even though we didn't actually own the building, uh, Halloween parties, anything to get the public into the space and get a look at it. Then, then finally, in uh, 2003, we were able to buy the theater building. Again, not that space next door that I'll be talking about more later in relation to this project. But we bought the building and were able to start renovations. Of course, all the asbestos and other nastiness had to be removed. The new roof went on. Uh, that was a high priority because the old roof was leaking quite a bit and so obviously a new roof was key to keeping the building stable. 2004 we started to have our own events in the building. They were BYOS, bring your own seats, because we didn't have any of our own. But then uh, in 2003 we had some seats donated from the movie theater, the big Hoyts Theater down in Bangor. Funny story, just last year, the uh, movie theater down in Bangor was again renovating their space. So we got another set of seats from them to replace the ones they'd given us back in 2003. And you'll see some pictures of those later. Uh, we were able to rebuild uh, the marquee that had been part of downtown for so many years. Uh, we hired a great company down in Lewiston that was able to recreate the original marquee. Uh, and many people, even though it was missing from downtown for 30 years, a lot of people have a hard time remembering that it was ever gone. Uh, it's really been a great thing for us downtown. In 2005, we started having regular programming and we're happy to start selling out those concerts and events. Unfortunately, once we got people in there, we realized that that rubber roof sounded like a rubber drum when it rained hard. So if you happen to ever go to Google Maps, you can spot the theater very easily from a satellite view because the uh, roof is now green astroturf. Uh, practically speaking, it saved us a lot of money, but it also <laughs> is kind of fun to go up there and putt around if you feel like it. So the theater had our grand opening in 2006, um, ready to bring a full schedule of movies, community events, cultural events, and gatherings to the community. I've got a few pictures here that show what the theater looks like right now. That's the auditorium. There's a picture of our lobby looking from the entryway down towards concessions. This is our somewhat cramped but uh, fairly usable backstage space. I've got a couple dressing rooms and a workroom, bathroom back there. Live programming is a big part of what we do. These are some pictures from our community theater productions over the years. Uh, it's a great way for kids and adults to get out and do something that they don't get to do very often and also to give people in our community access to these events, which they wouldn't have otherwise. A big thing for us is the main Whoopie Pie Festival. The theater is the organizer of the festival. It's our, our, our largest annual fundraiser and is also the largest annual fundraiser for many other organizations in our community and we couldn't be prouder of it. Um, I guess this is a nice moment to talk a little bit about the economic impact of the theater without the slides going on. Let's see if that works. Um, we estimate that without the addition of the second screen, the theater generates about seven, seven hundred. $50,000 in economic impact annually. 
with that second screen in place, it'll be several hundred thousand dollars more bumping up against a million dollars. I should all say those are all pre-COVID numbers because none of us are really sure what the future holds. But regardless of what the numbers are, we know that this second screen space will be a huge addition for the theater and for the community. So to focus on that a little bit, the second screen space was that barber shop. It was a diner. Once we bought it, we turned it into our box office space. This is during those renovations. And then most recently, it was a coffee shop that was here for about five years. And once the coffee shop outgrew that space, we realized we had an opportunity to make it into a second screen. Uh, the second screen is going to be a huge asset for us as it helps us build capacity, flexibility, and also we'll be able to show more documentaries, independent films, and cultural films, films of local interest that we wouldn't be able to show otherwise. So this is a picture again of that coffee shop. And then after the demolition work was done, we got back to some of the bones of the building. The screen is gonna go on that back wall that you can see here. If we were standing there and turned around, you'd be able to see the seats starting to go in. So the risers being built, and then you see some of the carpeting starting to go on those risers. It'll have about 40 seats in it, but unfortunately that means 40 seats, 40 backs, 40 plus arms and all the other equipment that, that goes along with it. So it was a surprising amount of work to haul them all over, get them all cleaned and start setting them up. These are those seats that were newly donated to us by Hoyt Cinemas. And now this was a picture this afternoon. It actually is starting to look like a movie theater, which is awfully exciting. Uh, as far as some of the surprises we've encountered in the project, I mean, obviously COVID-19 is the biggest surprise of all. Um, there's no way to underestimate the impact it's had on the project itself. Um, we had hoped to have this open a month or two ago. Um, we're still working on it now. The main equipment supplier is in Kansas and can't travel to the state until their company allows it to enter a state that's in quarantine. So we're really unsure when we'll be able to get this open. As far as some more enjoyable surprises, as we were pulling out some of the very original walls and doing some work on the floor, we did find some old uh, bank receipts and bank statements from 1948. Um, and I'm guessing that it wasn't good news because we also found tucked away this old empty bottle of uh, Seagram's. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the news was, but I don't think it was good. But that was kind of a fun surprise we found along the way. So I think, yeah, that concludes my little slideshow. Uh, so let me stop oh. the screen sharing if I can manage that. Oop, did I? I, I reclaimed oh, it. Go. I yeah. got it. Thanks. Thanks. There we go. Patrick, that's so awesome. I, it's such a bummer about COVID, obviously, for all of us. And yeah, to hear the, that story. The, the movie <laughs> industries, had, who knows? We had. Uh, we decided we'd be uh, opening, reopening this Friday, and we are, um, obviously with as many health and safety protocols in place as we can. Um, but literally two days after we announced that and sent out 500 odd letters, um, all the movie distributors pulled their major movies from releasing in July. So <laughs> we're getting a chance to show some of those independent movies we wanted to start showing, um, as well as some classics like, uh, Oh, Sing, Trolls World Tour, which came out a few weeks ago, um, the first Harry Potter movie, and other fun things. And who knows what the future will bring. We're in an economic place where we have to find out for ourselves what our community is interested in doing as far as attending movies. Um, so we're giving it two months to find out if there's an audience out there. Um, if there is, we'll figure out how to operate with that audience and if no one's interested in seeing movies anymore then we'll probably shut down until they are um live theater is also 
even more problematic when you think about small rehearsal spaces and dressing rooms. Um, outdoor venues are fairly limited up here. So yeah, biggest surprise of all. Let's hear it for 2020. <laughs> but I will say to end on a bright note that, you know, the support of Northeast Heritage Economy Program, USDA, all our funders, the progress that we have made on the second screen has been a huge boost for the morale of the theater. Just being able to get something done and show that we're able to move forward on anything has been great. So thank you. No, oh, you're welcome. And thanks to the federal government for the support, right? Yeah. The seats oh, yeah. look great, by the way. They look they like they're in really, really good shape. Yeah. They do. That uh, I will admit, I didn't take a close up picture in good lighting because uh, <laughs> we got them after they'd been used for 16 years down in Bangor. And granted, yeah. we, did, we, we high graded the best seats for us to use, but <laughs> they certainly show their wear and tear. But. Gotcha. Um, does anyone on the call have any questions for Patrick or any comments? And I will let everyone know that Don is back. Um, and we had another guest waiting in the waiting room as well. So thanks for your patience, both of you. Um, it's a limitation of the host structure. Only the host can admit. So we'll step back to Don after um, anyone that has any questions or comments for, um, for Patrick. It's a great project. It's great for Dover Foxcroft. If you want to make a comment or have a question, you can just unmute yourself and, and have at it or throw it in the chat. So we'll wait like two seconds to give people a chance. Well, thanks everybody. It's real, it's yeah. always a fun thing to talk about the theater. So I appreciate the opportunity. And yes, I certainly hope to see everybody up here when you feel comfortable coming to the movies or a show. So thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Don, thanks for your patience. So we'll sure. step back to Thanks you. for your patience. Uh, <laughs> sorry, we had a power outage. <laughs> Welcome to Maine, right? Lightning struck. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's just started to rain here. So if I disappear, my apologies to everyone. Um, well, you pick up where I left off. I was just on the plaster stuff. Yeah, yeah. Let me um, pass it back over to you. There you go. You are now the host. Don, are you there? Okay. Uh, Don, you're on mute. Don, you're muted. Don, you're on mute. The menu without going off to unshare. So I'm, 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 you can hear me now. Yes. Okay. There. Uh, you can see that uh, there are uh, all these small pieces. These are all pieces that have been glued. All of this has been glued in. All of this has been glued back in. Oh, come on. This shows uh, the center medallion. Uh, that had to be uh, almost completely re-glued in as well. Uh, there are 18 medallions in the building, and each one is unique. And uh, these are about 32 inches in diameter. And um, this one, of course, is the Lamb of God. It shows uh, uh, a sheep with a, with a cross. And um, So, Don, will, when this work is done, will there be any kind of protective coating put over it? Can you talk a little bit about... No, I, I, I don't. No, we're not. No, I don't think so. Uh, it's all fresco, mm -hmm. uh, and the the paint is not a surface film. The paint is part of the plaster, and so we're we're gluing them back in, and uh, we're washing them with um, with water. Uh, it's mostly dust on it, and then uh, any places that we have to infill with a little bit, like all the nail holes. You can see a bunch of nail holes here. Mm -hmm. All of those nail holes will have to fill in with little bits. I'm letting Joe Arthur Harrison in. Uh, 
you put little bits of plaster and then we'll paint it and let it set for a, a week or two. And then we wash the whole thing with detergent. And what it does, it takes the gloss off the paint, that the new paint and, and uh, cleans off the old uh, stuff really well and, and, and holds up really well. Okay. I think a protective coating would not protect it. Gotcha. Uh, the reason why it's held up so well as it is, is because of the, uh, because it had tin over it. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, it's not letting me advance again. Oh, maybe I, so I'm doing with the wrong. Yeah, I'm using the, I'm using my right click rather than my left click. <laughs> Sorry about that. In in this slide, you can see the top part here. This is the this is the bay that we've been working on the most. Uh, this bay doesn't have nearly as many voids. We just put this piece in today. Uh, when we put the pieces in, we glue them in, fit them in. They have to be lightly hammered in. The plaster is very tough. It's almost like pottery. Uh, I think it's a mixture. It's a mixture of something. It's gray like gypsum, la uh, gypsum plaster, but it's hard like lime plaster, and it's got wood in it. It's got uh, wood fiber in it. Uh, wow. And it, it, it's very tough. And the wood fibers, believe it or not, as short as they are, they still hold the pieces together uh, in many instances. And then um, once we get it in there, we have to clamp it for 12 hours. And so we clamp it to the scaffolding, which means you can't move around on the scaffolding. So you clamp everything up at the end and, uh, and, and it works. It works out pretty well. This part down here is the center aisle and you can see there are no voids to speak of. There are only two places where plaster fell out. And that's because um, someone in the attic stepped in the wrong place because there aren't protective boards in the attic. And when it was being insulated, I think some worker stepped in the wrong place and um, I'm sure he had to change his pants after. Because it's, <laughs> it's a 41 foot drop. Oh boy. Yeah. Don, what are you gluing with? Lexel. It's a kind of a caulking. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, when we make a mistake, we can you, if you get right to it, like within an hour or so, you can take it back down. Uh, the 12 hours makes a big difference. And uh, the, where we have to kind of hammer it, ha hammer it through a little bit, and it, like I say, we're not talking about hammering is the only term I can use, but it's, it's a real soft hammering. Uh, it's where the keyways go through. So the Lexel is on the keyways, and so it's, you know, really gluing it into those keyways. So this, this uh, section has, doesn't have very many voids. Okay, next. This is the, uh, the next section after that. There are gonna be a lot of voids here, but we're saving this one for last uh, because uh, there are four sections that we have the plaster for. And uh, once we get to this one, all the plaster that's left will go to this one. So it'll make it a, make it a whole lot easier. This is where we started. You can see the, uh, the corners, this was all glued back in. In fact, more of it is glued, glued in now. That big um, two is not really on the slide. It's it's uh, from the iPad that we're, we're using to uh, to put the, the pieces together. So Don, maybe can you share a little bit about the the expected economic impact that this project is going to have on the community? Well, the maybe economic for... impact right now is we've doubled yeah. the workforce of the town. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Terry, my contractor, has worked for me since 1992. Uh, so the economic impact is very real with him because he's had probably 10 or 15 guys working for him over that period of time. So there's that. The other thing is, is um, there is a whole network of historical societies up here. We have eight museums. 
um, in, in the region. And the region runs from Hamlin to Allagash, which is well over 100 miles. And in that 100 miles, there are 12,000 people. And among those 12,000 people, there are eight museums. And then there are four on the Canadian side. And so we have a circuit of museums. And it takes three days to visit the whole circuit. Um, and so part of our impact is the fact that we're part of a, of a region. Uh, and we, we are a cultural byway. We're the, we are the first cultural byway. There are a lot of scenic byways in the state. We're the first cultural byway. And they were putting in an application now for it to become a national byway. Um, so when, and I'm being optimistic, when that happens, then the impact will be even greater. And so uh, our, our museum is, um, we're the only large national, there are, there are a couple of other national um, uh, national Historic Sites mm -hmm. properties, na National Register properties, uh, but we're the largest National Register property uh, in the state. And we'll, we're probably the only property that's a former church where we're completely restoring the exterior and interior to its original condition. Great. And so uh, it's important for that, that reason as well. And uh, we just made some directory of American architecture. We just got put in that. And, um, and also the, uh, there are a lot of, there are a lot of things in the works that are, are happening right now at the, at, on the national level where we're getting included in things. Um, there is a, I don't even remember the name of it. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, but uh, it has to do with the National Trust, and um, that, that isn't probably even the name of it. But in any case, the uh, your parent organization. The National they, Trust, yeah. It is the National Trust, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, they, they just put together a, a, a directory, and we were, the, we were the first one on it, which was amazing. That's terrific. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Don. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, um, sorry for those glitches. Jeez. No, that's okay. I mean, next time it will be like the, the lady in Lewiston who was taking a driver's test and put her car through the front window of the driving <laughs> exam place. She said, next time I will do better. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great for your first time. Um, okay. So I'm going to be sharing my screen and we're going to talk about the f next, the Farwell Project in Thorndike Village. Um, Diana Prizio is the Executive Director of Timelines Community and she is not on the call. I just checked. She had a rescheduled doctor's appointment today. So she's very sorry not to be here um, and share the wild ride that this project has been on. Um, but she did share her pictures with us and our um, Field Services Manager Jonathan Hall, who is on the call, has been consulting on this project and been out to the site and met with Diana, the architect, some of the contractors over the past um, couple months as um, the project has developed and new exciting um, features have come to light that we're going to show you some pictures of during this part of the presentation. Um, but just to orient the crowd, so this is uh, the Farwell um, general store, hardware store in Thorndike Village. It's part of a complex of buildings that is being worked with by this organization and their grant um, is to enter into a set of rehabilitation of the structure that you're looking at, which is part of the complex, um, to uh, redo the foundation and another uh, a number of other modifications um, to enable it to be reopened as a store as well as the museum and rental and um, uh, maker space. Um, so it's, it's a pretty exciting, ambitious project. Um, it's part of a larger project, as I described, uh, this complex. They're in phase six of a 10 phase multi-year redevelopment um, program for, for this area. Um, I won't go into the whole history 
of how this the Far World General store in Thorndike Village got itself together. But um, Down East Magazine did a great piece on Thorndike in the 1960s after um, the last Farwell uh, person who ran this hardware store, the family, passed away. He um, was very generous with the town and individuals in it. And it's a really great story. And if you just Google um, you know, downeast.com and Farwell, you'll find this story. And we can also circulate it afterwards. So I won't belabor that. The history is fantastic in its own right. Um, but this is the building, the structure that is the focus of the project. And um, she started these pictures with us of some of the interior um, that they cleaned up before this project done, got underway. It was given with a lot of uh, materials from when it was an active business still inside it, along with all sorts of other accumulated um, geegaws. And um, this is what the east side of the building looked like. And this is the wide um, before they got to work. And you can see that sagging and bulging that's happening in this building. Um, and there it is, lifted up off the ground because redoing the foundation is a large part of this project. So Jonathan, if you want to unmute, if you're not already, um, I'll kick it over to you and I can just, you know, go through the photos. Are you there? Jonathan? There you are. I think we can't hear you, Jonathan, for some reason. You are not muted, so you're ready. How about now? Come on. Yes. There you are. <laughs> All right, good. Yes. Um, so where to begin on the Farwell project? So I have had uh, uh, significant enga engagement on this project because it's been it's an interesting cast of characters. Uh, we have Diana, who's a 70 plus year old little whirlwind of a, of a woman. I think she, I think she started, uh, her engagement with this complex back in the late nineties, maybe mid nineties. Um, and she's, she's done amazing work so far. So, and she's, uh, she sees opportunities where I think other people would see problems. So uh, behind here. With, with this little uh, ventilator on the top is an old seed mill. Uh, and so that's the building she kind of started with. Uh, so now it's a sort of antique store, uh, performance space, educational space. And most interestingly is, is all the seed mill mechanism at the top of the building is still intact. So it's amazing. I've never seen anything like it before. So she left all that intact, and but and she's using the space. So there's a little a little performance space up there. So it has this feel like you're in somebody's treehouse or something like that, because you have all this this old wooden seed mill mechanism around you, uh, and it's 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 just an amazing space. And then uh, behind that, there was a an, another building that's been converted into you know, educational sort of community space. Uh, they have uh, a pretty close relationship with the railroad that runs right next to the building, which at one time was the Belfast Moosehead Railroad. Uh, and currently in the summertime, there's a little, you know, a little tourist train that runs from uh, Union down to Thorndike. Uh, so they, they get some some visitors from that. They have these interesting uh, railroad bikes that you can rent. <laughs> so you can ride these uh, railroad bicycles from Thorndike down towards Belfast a few miles. Uh, and it just looks like great fun. Uh, she's got, you know, a bookstore in part of it. She's got uh, some, some old train artifacts that she's trying to restore some box cars and some old passenger cars and when she when she bought the Farwell General Store building the town of Thorndike threw in the Grange Hall that was next door uh, <laughs> just to, to sweeten the deal so she hasn't even she hasn't even thought about what she's going to do with that yet so but she's she's definitely got uh uh you know, the, the vision and uh the drive to get some things done uh, the, the general store itself is just, it's a, it's a time capsule. It's, 
uh, there were so many artifacts in there when I saw it, at which point it had been partially cleared out, partially cleaned out. But she was talking about, you know, even, I'm glad these were not in there when I, when I visited, but she was talking about boxes of uh, DDT in there from when it was a general store. And uh, they had just been in there since back in the 1960s when the store closed and nobody ever, which might help to explain why they didn't have more with, uh, with pests and the insect <laughs> capture. Uh, so it's, it's just, you know, all around interesting place. Their, their architect that has been volunteering his time is a retired main guide slash architect who grew up in Thorndike and then left to go work in Portland and Boston and uh, as, as a, doesn't use a cell phone and doesn't use AutoCAD and doesn't, you know, all his, his, his drawings are hand drawn. So everything uh, is unique to the project. So it's, uh, uh, and then they're, you know, they've got a, their contractor who's doing this, uh, you know, character in his own right uh but is uh you know they're making adjustments as they go they encountered a, a spring uh under the building so that whole so this side of the building that we're looking at right now now uh entire foundation had had failed uh this was the side of the building that had the big slump in it uh and the the working theory at the outset of the project was that uh, as water and runoff was coming down the hill, it was collecting under the building because that was the low point. Uh, the, the building was below grade. Uh, but as soon as they jacked the building up, they discovered a spring underneath the building. So it was, you know, the curveball that nobody ever expected. And, so it had to shift gears very quickly to to make accommodations with that, and then you know it turns out that you know the the spring showed up on old railroad survey maps. It was technically railroad property, uh, and uh, it was it was just uh, you know up in not the again Diane. Uh, through her ingenuity and force of personality, uh, negotiated a solution for within a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty funny in her notes to us. So there actually is a, a well that was dug at some point, I think she said in the 60s. Um, and they think that this spring was what they were aiming for, but they missed it and went 200 feet further down and came up with terrible sulfur water. Meanwhile, just a little right near it was the tender, delicious sweet water spring. So they, they now set up a pump that they're gonna use this water when it's available. It did dry up for a little bit, but now that it started raining again, it's um, yeah. got liquid again. And she has some pictures here of you know a cistern that they put in to handle you know it is kind of wet and overflowing mm. and they're draining the water back into that original granite culvert that goes under the railroad tracks i mean she solved this problem so quickly yeah uh um, incidentally and I've, uh she's I've got some pictures that, here uh, showing i've heard that don Sear in lille has the best drinking water in the state of maine really yeah that's what i heard Ah. I don't think Nestle knows about that yet. <laughs> so um, some other pictures that um, Diana shared um, was taking a look at the footer. They poured this. They had they they definitely had some dramas and clashes oh, yeah. between the architect and the contractor in how to approach some of the the foundation work. Um, it's largely resolved now. She wanted to share. Um, they've decided on an additional center footer to enhance this project. And she shared some rot to show you what's going on in the beams. Um, 
And this is the current status. So the forms, they started to put forms in. There was some more discussion about the approach this would take. Um, and this is where it sits because the, uh, they've moved to another project briefly. And they said, she wrote, they say every day they're going to be coming back, but they have uh, yet. They, they have brought some equipment back. Yes. So that's encouraging. So yeah. I think they will, they will start up working again pretty soon. I do too. I mean, it's been an exciting project. The spring, I, I don't know, I think everyone almost lost their minds when, when the water started welling up. Yeah. It was so hot. Yeah, and then the, the first, um, the first they, recommendation was we'll have to dig up the railroad tracks and put a new culvert in. They should, they should <laughs> bottle that water and sell it as the mist spring water. <laughs> Very good. That's I like good it. <laughs> sell it in the gift shop. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, so those are the pictures from Diana, and I am sorry that she isn't here because she's like uh, uh, Jonathan said. I mean, she's an amazing force of nature, and she, she spins a yarn. So hopefully, at yeah. some point in the future, we'll get her to say in her own words, um, you know, what's happening on the ground here. Um, and that's funny, Alan. It totally is. I mean, it's like a, it's a money pit situation, right? Just one thing after another. So hopefully this was the last thing. And from here on yeah. out, it'll be smooth sailing. Well, she has been uh, doing some amazing things with very, I mean, everybody who does this kind of project does amazing things with no resources. And she is no exception to that. That seems to be the main way. Yeah. It is. And I, yeah, and I will say, I mean, as part of their grant, largely, almost all of their uh, matches in kind, which is really unusual. She yeah. has over 200 people in town that are volunteering time and participating on this project, in, in, including the architect that she referenced, yeah. who's really donated a serious amount of uh, time to the project. But he's exceedingly hard to get a hold of because he doesn't use a mobile phone. Yeah. Um, he'll just disappear for weeks at a time. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, next up, finally, but not leastly, is um, the Central Hall building in Dover, Cross, Dover Foxcroft, which is um, part of the Central Hall Commons Main Highland Community Center. And um, uh, Tara Smith is the gal that we've been working with most closely on this project, but she was unable to join us today. Um, so in her stead, uh, Leslie Farnell has kindly, the president of Central Hall Commons, has kindly uh, stepped in to share um, some of what's going on up at Dover Foxcroft. Tell us a little bit about the project, its, it's focus and scope, and um, you know, what the uh, economic impact is gonna be for the local community. Great, can you hear me? I can, Leslie, did you decide, do you have any slides that you wanna share have, or something? Yeah, I, I do, but I won't leave this picture up for just a second. Okay. Um, and then I'll, I'll switch to my, my, I'll ask you to share, give me this. Absolutely. Picture. Um, this is a, a photograph of, I, I'm sort of pinch hitting, so I, I don't have nearly as beautiful a presentation as some of you, but this is a picture of Central Hall as it looks now. And uh, Central Hall was actually originally built in 1883. And if you look at this picture, this section, can you see my cursor? You uh, no, because we're looking okay. at my screen. Okay, so that's just on my screen. Yeah. Well, off to the left, you can see that there's a an addition. There, there are the three sets of windows, and then off mm -hmm. to the left, there's an addition. That's a 12-foot addition that houses, um, that we were required to build because um, it houses, among other things, the elevator shaft, the, uh, the emergency exits that we were re required to install, uh, in order to get occupancy and our kitchen that we are um, we are currently that you are helping us fund so that's all in the new the new building but the the part we did see an old photograph actually at Central Hall in Patrick's um, talk and mm -hmm. that only included the first um, the first two thirds that's on the left the right hand side of your picture. Um, so let me have a screen share. Let me have the screen. Yep, absolutely. There you go. Thank you. Okay. So so um, let's see. So we are um, the central hall was built, as I say, originally as a community center in um, in eighteen eighty three. 
and it was a community center for the the larger community. It served for years as the town hall. It served um, if, when I first moved to town here in 1979. Um, we had the town offices in here, and we also had the uh, sheriff's office in the space that I'm going to show you. And I have lots of photographs of that, but unfortunately, um, I don't have the photograph. Actually, I'm going to show you something else here for a second. Um, and uh, so we have, I'm going to show you just quickly a little video of what this space that we're going to be looking at looked like. Um, in, and it is a little video. So, great. So we can't actually see what you're looking at yet, though, just FYI. You can't see it? No. It's not being shared. Yeah, I think you, maybe you select the wrong view. You know how it gives you the program or the desktop? Hold on. Let me give it another shot. Let me get back to it here. So um, remind me what I need. Oh, share. No, what do I have to share to show to do that? So when you click on the share screen, you're going to get a, a pop-up screen that shows tiles. Oh, uh, yeah, right. OK. Look, look for the one, yeah. Can you see it now? Yes. OK. It's the, There's a video here. Yep, so we I, can I'm see starting, it. I, I, let me actually start just a little bit back, because you'll see um, this oh, is not a, a long video, um, but you'll see this is the original Central Hall. And these are some of our supporters. <laughs> who actually went to school and played basketball in the second floor of Central Hall. That early shot was really illuminating because from all the road and from all the pictures that are available, you can't really see how deep that building is. It's a lot larger than I actually thought it was. It's huge. These are the towns that we serve, actually, this is the region we serve. And this particular picture is the space that we're going to be talking about. Original plan was to be a senior center. Yeah. 
had a significant donation to the commons um, for many reasons. I think that organizations and community benefit groups like the commons need to be supported by public funds, but they also need to be supported by private funds. None of this this is the balcony. Be supported solely by grant funding. It's important for it to have support broadly across the community, and that means that people who live in the community, and for this, for the commons, it's not just the around residents, it's the summer residents that actually support the community by in-kind contributions or opening up their wallets. One thing that people don't realize is Americans are some of the most philanthropic people in the world. 85% of Americans actually give to their communities, and this is an incredibly worthy cause. Join us. 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 Your friends and neighbors have already. This is the basement. And a half dollars. And we've got that lap and plaster as well. Your contribution is first. So I'm going to stop sharing that and just um, talk briefly about where we are now and what we're looking at for this project. We have raised um, 200. Um, oh, let me let me just get this on. Oh wait a minute, I'm, I have to go back to. Hold on, let's go back to. There we go. So. Um, we have raised um, over $2.2 million for this project, which is, it has been to renovate this building, which was falling apart. It had a roof leak, just like your, the other buildings that we've seen. Uh, the roof was leaking, the floor and the second floor, which was a basketball court and, and an event center, uh, was completely destroyed by the leaking water. Um, we had to take the building down to her bare bones. Um, it took out all the lath and plaster, all the asbestos uh, remediation. Um, we had several Brownfields grants. Um, we renovated the stage, which I'm not going to show you because that's not part of this particular project, but, but we, um, the, the NHEP is, is funding, but we uh, actually renovated the stage and replaced, it had a bowed front originally and it had been cut off so that the basketball court could be put in. And so we renovated the front bow on the, on the uh, stage. Um, we have, there will be another picture here where you'll see we have some knees that are supposed to go back under the eaves out front or you know around the, the roof line. And we've got them, we've had them made and painted and they're just waiting to be installed. Um, the, the NHEP grant, um, what is left to, to fund for this project was the back down the first floor. Um, and that has been the last part of this project. We are now about $60,000 from completing the project. I am really excited to say. And the um, NHEP grant, which has been so helpful, um, combined with a USDA grant and fundraising locally um, is going to allow us to complete our downstairs kitchen, which is what you see here. Uh, you're looking in towards the kitchen. We just had the floor. The floor is almost finished now. We have to put the, um, the baseboards around and they're coming tomorrow to install those. Um, but um, the flooring is in here and we had this flooring done in, in this area. Um, and I will um, find the other photos that I have to figure out how to find again. No, that's not what I want. How do I get back to that? Screen share. Screen share. Um, So this is that space that you saw the people walking through that was filled with stuff. Um, this is now a, a space that we're going to be using for, um, for uh, older adults to exercise. We've got a, a donated pool table. Uh, we've been painting this area um, and painting the posts. And um, this area is going to be used for community gatherings, for, for not for organizations and functions that are smaller than what would be using the second floor event center, 
Um, we have some office space down here as well that we can use to, um, to, to uh, support some of the other organizations that are aligned with our, with our vision. Um, our vision, we have just been re reviewing our vision and mission statements and our current mission, uh, which is a somewhat of a revision because we've moved into a multi-generational center and away from just a senior center. So now we do want space to have older adults come in during the day and have meals and have activities uh, in, a, in a space, but it won't be a, um, an isolated locked adult day service center for various economic reasons, we didn't feel we could actually make that fly. We, we wanted somebody to run it and we couldn't find anybody to run it. And so we decided instead, because there's a great need in the community for people with dementia to have a place to be during the days, we would do a partial social model um, day program that would be run two or three half days a week uh, just to provide a place for so that caregivers would have some respite. So that is still in the, in the plan. Um, and this space would be used for that. And that kitchen space would also be used for our senior luncheon program. But um, our current mission is to nurture a welcoming, inclusive, healthy, rural community culture by engaging people and organizations in the Maine Highlands region in connecting, celebrating, and learning together. And we're focusing on um, educational programming, uh, lifelong learning programs, and, or, and um, workshops and programs that bring people together to have conversation right we've we've actually learned a lot through the covid crisis and one of the things we've learned is how to be uh virtual and how to run um conferences um you know on zoom and one of the things we're realizing is we can bring people in the community together to run to have conversations about really important topics and now historically is a time when i think we communities need to have conversations that are open to the public that that really draw people in and so we're beginning to use that a little bit while we're closed we are completely closed we do not have anybody coming in at this time because of the you know the restrictions um, on the space so um, we are finishing this the kitchen project we are sixty thousand dollars from having enough funding to actually finish it with furnishings and, and all that. Um, and um, we are still working on the painting and finishing the, 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 this downstairs area. Um, and I don't know when it will be finished. I mean, the timing, it's been kind of slow going. But mm -hmm. um, uh, so anyway, that's, I, I don't know that I need to, so, to say more, except that we're very grateful for the support that we've gotten. Um, we have a fundraising um, um, capital campaign letter going out soon. We need to get a little more to finish this project, but it's been since 2012. We started this in 2012 and we just, I've had to learn patience because I was there at the beginning and I have to tell you, it's required a whole lot of patience. <laughs> but when I heard that there, when I heard that that last project had been going since 19, right. <laughs> I don't know when I, I the 1990s. I thought, well, you know, we're doing pretty well. So um, anyway, project. we are we are in terms of the economy. The other thing I will say about this project, you were asking about the economic impact. The economic impact of actually the renovation has been <laughs> substantial. Of that 2.2 million dollars, 80 percent of it has been spent locally. So, so we have purchased our, we've tried very hard to use local contractors and to purchase our supplies, our building supplies and all of that locally, whatever we could. Some things couldn't be like the sprinkler system, you know, is centralized in Augusta and all that. But, but we, we, have, uh, we have really used local contractors. So we've put a lot of money back into the community just in the rebuilding and provided a lot of jobs for people. Mm -hmm. um, moving forward, um, our contribution, I think, um, as a as a um, community center, will be um, there will be some job creation. Uh, we right now we have three employees, part but they're part time at the moment, partly because we can't, we don't have any income, so at the moment they're they're part time, and um, and our but our hope is that we would we would be able to increase that and. 
my vision is that that kitchen, for example, which is going to be kind of a commercial kitchen, that ultimately, instead of one day a week luncheon program, we can actually open it up and have a daily luncheon program and hire a you know, mm -hmm. part-time cook and, and um, that our staff will, will become busy enough that we'll, we, we need them full-time and janitorial services right. and things like that. So we actually have a question for you from the audience. Um, you referenced that you also received a USDA grant. Um, they're interested. What was the interest of the USDA? Can you, you know? Well, the USDA has been ha, gave us a grant uh, to complete the upstairs to help us complete the um, the area, the, the stage, and the upstairs area. And there's another part of the downstairs here, which is in the front of the building which is a, um, a smaller space for meetings, a meeting space. And so in every step of the way, as I say, we've been raised, we have not been able to do any work until we raise the money. So every time we raise the money, we, we then proceed with a little more of the work. Right. But we were working with them on, um, they were supporting the, the upstairs stage area and the balcony and the renovations of the upstairs yeah. space so but i think from the perspective of the usda they're interested i think this is through like a rural communities initiative it's a rural community, yeah yeah it's a rural community grant and mm -hmm. and the way this impacts our community honestly is that um we envision this as being the con a convener for one of the things that we would like to be doing is convening being a convener for other organizations in the community. This is the only large space that is a community convening space. And um, so of course we have in the event center, we have weddings and, and, and birthdays and, and annual meetings for organizations. A lot of nonprofits rent our space to do their annual meeting. The town um, Economic Development Council does their annual meeting there, Center Theater. Uh, uses the stage as a um, not only a rehearsal stage for some of their productions, but also use we have um, have used used it for the children's theater programs. We've had some other theater programs. Um, dinner theater, for example, is is well suited to our space. We one of the things we had to do to make that we've just completed recently is installing some sound acoustic panels up there because it was a little bit acoustically a little bit bright so there are lots of and that was that was supported um, by the USDA grant partly perfect thank you thanks Leslie yeah um does anyone have any questions for anybody any of our speakers about their programs their buildings their projects this is a great discussion and the imagery has been fantastic we started our project in uh, 1983, <laughs> and so Patience is our middle name. Uh, I feel better. I feel a lot better. Jeez. Uh, and what happened, the reason why the, the church closed is because there's another church three miles away, and our area has lost 80% of its population, mainly because of out-migration and also because family size has been reduced from 20 to two <laughs> and um, so that I mean, we really lost a lot of population that way and they chose to to close the older and more historic building which is fantastic for us and um, in uh, I was able to get to know the bishop in the course of uh, of the whole closing of the of the church and, and uh, this would be Bishop O'Leary and in the end, he said, you know, we've got a problem. We don't know what to do with the building. We can't tear it down. It's on the National Register. We shouldn't anyway. And we'd be rubbing salt in the wounds of the people in the parish who now have to go to another church. And um, so um, I said, well, gee, uh, it'd make, make a great museum, cultural center, and realized that I was changing my life in that eight second little speech. But um, that's that's how it started. And um, so for the same reason we've been doing, we've been writing grants since 1983. And I, I swear I've written 700 grants and you only get funded by 50% of them. And, uh, and, and in the state of Maine, it's, especially if you're in a remote area, there are extremely few granting grantors 
that are interested in doing bricks and mortar kinds of uh, projects in rural areas. You know, there's, there are just, you know, Stephen King, the Davis Foundation, uh, Belvedere Foundation, uh, Morton Kelly, and that's about it. And uh, so it's yeah. very, when, when, when you have a substantial grant, you know, we've been operating on $20,000 grants forever. And uh, to have a larger uh, amount makes makes such a huge difference. Such a huge difference. Great, great. Okay, I have another question. Um, in fact, Leslie's answering it online. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, so, Don and Patrick, are you using any composite materials to replace natural, i.e., wood materials? It's probably Don would be maybe for you. I have. We have used for the first time. We have. Uh, on that leak on the side of the tower where I, I showed you the first photo that there was a composite material there that we're using because there's until that that problem of that drainage is solved uh, it, it will always be a problem so we decided to do that there rather than use uh, like the original materials but other than that no Thanks. And uh, John and everyone, um, Leslie actually answered on the chat for the commons. They did use composite concrete board for the siding due to longevity. We do not want to use vinyl, but that's a compromise due to maintenance. Um, we weren't involved in that part of the project, so. <laughs> yeah. No. You know, uh, what, um, one time that there was a lady who came into our museum and, and she was wondering, you know, you know, how much money it costs and everything. She says, why aren't you, why are you doing this? Why aren't you helping the poor instead? And I couldn't believe it. Of and all the other people in the group couldn't believe it. And started justifying how, you know, we're trying to, to increase tourism and that's going to increase the economy and all that kind of thing. And weren't getting very far with her. And Terry happened to be, our con my contractor happened to be working in another room and he stuck his head out and he yelled, I'm the poor. Oh my goodness. But I've been, you know, he's been working for us since, uh, since 1992. So it's been giving him and, and, and the men who work for him employment. So <laughs> that silenced her a little bit. But in the meantime, I, what, what, what warmed my heart were the 20 other people who rolled their eyes when she said that. So it's hard sometimes. It really is. That's a, I mean, it's, it's tough. And it's it is. getting tougher. Um, and Leslie did add um, the wainscoting upstairs, um, was, and which isn't the focus of this grant, and she did have a couple of pictures, is all hand hewn and mo milled locally ash, which is super great. The stage looked great in that little bit of the pictures that we saw. I'm looking forward no, to seeing just, it at some point. I just want to, we've tried really quite hard, particularly with the hall upstairs and the front entryway, to try to ma maintain its old appearance. And all of the lighting, for example, was all had to be replaced. All the electrical wiring had to be replaced. Mm -hmm. But we tried to make it as true to historical, you know, um, what they the old ones looked like. And if you ever want to see that, we have the old photographs of what it looked like the day it opened. And the lamps, of course, those lamps were gas lamps. They weren't electric. But we tried mm -hmm. to really replace the lamps with things that looked very similar. We've really tried hard to do that. Um, but there have been some compromises. As I say, the siding was a compromise. We, we just couldn't afford. Right. We didn't want to do vinyl. That was disgusting. No, thank and you. So <laughs> we, yeah, right. And, but this was a, a bit of a compromise, um, you know, so that we wouldn't have to repaint it every couple of years. Right. It is. It's really hard. And compromises have to happen to make projects happen. Totally understand. Any other questions? Don, I am just uh, fascinated with that plaster. I can't get I it out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, it's not like a three coat plaster system. We've got the brown coat. No, that's the rough coat. So it's just one coat. Just one rough coat. And it's hard, like you said, it's almost like clay. It, uh, when, when you take a piece of the plaster that's down, it feels like greenware pottery. Right. That's amazing. And it's got, yeah. it's got wood as a, as a binder and not like fine sawdust as a binder and not. Exactly. That's a, it's just. It's very, very unusual. Yeah, I've never heard of anything like that. I've been trying to get the formula to, 
you know, we're, I, I'm sure that in the end, we're going to have to put all of the pieces back rather than and, yeah. and use as little new plaster as possible. Yeah. Uh, but um, our priority is to get the, the stuff that's painted first, you know, with the figures on it. Right. Uh, but in, we've got 12 bays in all and uh, that we're doing and four bays of plaster has been revealed. But in the other eight bays, the wood is still up on the ceiling. Right. And uh, there are two by fours, then there's uh, tongue and grooved lumber under that. And when they were putting in the tin, because everything was covered with tin, Right. When they were putting in the tin, all the banging loosened the plaster on the flat ceilings. Right. And uh, so we realized after we took down the plaster of four bays and had very little place to put it inside that huge building, uh, we, we realized that we best leave it there. And then when we go to take the wood down, we know where the plaster is because it only fell four inches. Right. So when we take, the new, when we take that down, we'll glue the plaster back right away. Right. And, and that, not, not only that is we'll also have the wood that's there, the two by fours to, to, uh, to clamp against. Right. Then and in that, the end, when it comes down to, when it comes to time to take down the two by fours, we take a, uh, cut a knife and we cut around the head of the, the six inch spike that's holding it into the, into the ceiling. Make uh, so easy. And use a really long pry bar and very gently pry it. And we've been able to remove those without loosening any plaster. Yeah. So. And then uh, it, it seems to be like a, a true fresco technique where they, the, yes. the pigment was applied while the plaster was still wet. While it was still green, yep. Wow. And what, in order to do that, they would have had to have scaffolding over the entire interior of the building. Right which would have been a forest. Yeah. I'm sure that uh, when they took that down, they could build a house with a lumber. Yeah. And, um, and then, um, because they had to, and, and you can, the reason why the, the plaster failed in some places is because when they finished a day's work, they would go over, they started at the top and work their way down. They would go about six feet and then they would taper the plaster. And then, and the next time, overlap the taper. Right. When they overlap the taper, it didn't seal properly. Right. So any places where the plaster's failed, that's where it's failed. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, and you can, if a person took the time to sit down and count the areas where it is, you could, you could count the number of days it took to plaster. Right. Wow. It's that <laughs> obvious. You can see how much they could do in a day. Do you know anything about the original, the original builder? Yeah, that, that, that plaster was, was built in 1908, 1909. That plaster was covered in 1929 or 1930. Uh, and so it had never been repainted on the interior. Wow. So that's the original plaster uh, and the original color from when it was built. Amazing. Wow. So we're very that's lucky. Great. That's why we're so anal retentive about Putting it back. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, sw I swear one of these days. Any I'm other? Yeah, this is Alan Kratz. I want to compliment everyone who's presented. These are fascinating projects. And I have a question about the future. Is the Northern Borders Commission going to, uh, is this a continuing grant program that the Northern Borders Commission has? Or is this, uh, uh, what, what are the prospects for the future in terms of funding? Yes. Um, Thanks, uh, Alan, for your question. I, I'm just—I was just seeing it in the uh, in the group chat. Um, yeah, we um, we don't know. Uh, this was a special allocation uh, for this particular purpose, but they do have ongoing grant funds, so we anticipate uh, other opportunities. Now, the question is whether we'll be able to apply as quickly um, as we may like. Um, it seems like the main uh, projects are are moving right along. Um, and that really helps. Um, but of course, we have our other partners. And I know New York State, I think, has a, has a stoppage on construction. So that's right. not helping, uh, helping them move forward. So um, we have to spend a certain amount of our money in order to be eligible to apply again. 
Um, so it looks like it may be a little tough to do it this year with all the other challenges. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we would like to try um, in, in the ensuing year, or maybe uh, we can go it alone um, in Maine um, and, uh, you know, and, and apply uh, again. Uh, we found that uh, these, the projects that are going on throughout the state are really uh, fascinating. And, uh, you know, that, that leads into the slide that's up there. You know, we had a total of 62 applicants in Maine apply for, um, for the two funding sources. Um, so that's, that's uh, we, we do field services and, and last year, uh, that's Jonathan's job. Last year, uh, we helped about 200 uh, projects. And um, so it really has put us in touch with some other projects, some of the projects we didn't even know despite uh, all of the statewide activity that we're engaged in. Mm -hmm. um, so we will see, and same thing with 1772. We're not sure, uh, but we think the prospects of that are um, are, are uh, better um, because they're not going to require that all the money be uh, com all the projects be completed before we can uh, get another uh, another slug. But that is totally up to the foundation, so uh, we'll see how that goes uh, as well. But um, let me uh, let me congratulate um, all of our uh, all of our presenters. I, I, I found this fascinating as well. And, and Don and Patrick and, and Leslie, uh, you did a, a fantastic job in talking about your projects, um, and um, and were very inspiring. I think um, Joe Riley, who is the longtime mayor of Charleston, uh, relative to Don's uh, observation, uh, noted that you know the poor appreciate beauty too. Um, you know, this is not just uh, an, you know, uh, an exclusive kind of club. Um, and, you know, I'd observe that, uh, we, you know, we survive through food, clothing, and shelter, but uh, we thrive through our spirit. Um, and I think what we've seen today are, are the kinds of projects that make uh, spirit soar. So uh, thank you and congratulations uh, on, uh, uh, for all your efforts. Um, and thanks for hanging in. I know we ran over, but you know, couldn't stop. <laughs> yeah. Could this. I inter could I interject one little thing? Sure. Uh, first, last I'm month, close my windows, though. I'm now getting the thunderstorm. Yeah, yeah. Last uh, last um, two months ago, a man stopped in, and he saw, "Oh, you're gluing plaster." And he's from upstate New York, just moved to Limestone, and because his son works there, and he wants to be near his son, and. Um, he said, you're gluing plaster. I said, yeah, that doesn't happen very often. He said, well, I worked on a project where they glued plaster. He said, it was a mansion in upstate New York. I said, what was your budget? He said, $32 million. <laughs> and I said, uh, how did you get that funding? He said, three billionaires on our committee. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. so I thought, well, we're doing it. <laughs> we're doing it for under $100,000. <laughs> Well, Don, ask him back, call him back and ask for just one. I've been yeah. trying yeah, right? to find, I wrote down his name and I cannot find it. I wrote his name down and I cannot find Lost it. Lost opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to DFAS in Limestone and ask if there's someone there from upstate New York and try and track him down that way. Yeah, well. Yeah, I would. That's great. There's probably only one guy from upstate New York in Limestone. <laughs> I think you're right. It should be easy to find. I should just put out the call on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, go to the general <laughs> store. They they know his dog. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's like the man in Kansas who was streaking. Uh, <laughs> he was wearing a ski hat over his face, but everyone knew his dog. <laughs> anyway. Oh my goodness. <laughs> on that note, yeah. does anyone have any other comments? Or Going downhill from here. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. This is very and, good. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank uh, you for attending. Uh, one other quick note uh, to uh, who we have left, but you know, uh, the other three states we're working with all have state funding going for preservation projects on an annual basis. Uh, so that's something we've really got to get done uh, here in Maine. Um, yep. And. Um, and then I uh, hope, uh, you know, you'll think about supporting us too uh, when you can. Um, but we really appreciate uh, uh, these projects and, and uh, thanks for the, the uh, special presentations. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks,
Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. 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 So, bye. bye. bye.